Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining the final episode of our Inside Track series this year. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Max Blue Churchill. Max is an engineer, mix engineer, co-founder of the Trans Creative Collective, on the board of directors for Equality Engineering Brighton, and has been doing some amazing things for inclusivity and diversity in the music industry. But I think I just saw Max pop up on screen there. Hi, Max. How are things? Hi there. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. You have a lovely background today. Are thank you in you. studio today? I am. I'm at Strongham Studios. Uh, I'm actually currently sat in Studio One. Um, so it's pretty nice atmosphere in here right now. Yeah, who did the artwork in Strong Rooms? Or was it man- loads of different people, was it? I, I actually can't remember. And I know I'd be in so much trouble for that. Oh, uh, sorry. Get you in was, trouble in the first question. I, I'm terrible at names. That's the first thing. But um, yeah, it, it was all... Um, kind of done it was all custom done all in all of the rooms so cool yeah it's absolutely incredible um yeah it's, it's very it's very loud <laughs> yeah I, I hate when things feel real clinical in the studio though it kind of gives it a homely feel yeah yeah <laughs> but anyway I thought we'd get started by talking a little bit about your background if that's okay absolutely yeah have you always been into music since you were a kid I have I mean I have and I haven't in that as a kid um I had like quite a few different hobbies and things I was quite into sport and martial arts and things like that but um yeah I guess like the music was kind of always something which I think because I've I've always been quite like kind of sensitive to sounds and things like that I've always been like super interested whenever listening to music I've always just kind of been like how how has this been done like how is it made so yeah I've kind of to be fair is like far as I can remember back being like on holidays and things like that I'd be stood by like the pool if there was like music coming out of a PA or something just be like air drumming along or like air oh, guitaring amazing. along so I think I always had that kind of streak but, um yeah and were you were you interested in all kinds of music or did you have any specific artists that you were kind of into growing up yeah I mean I guess like I, I was really into Jimi Hendrix from like quite oh, a young <laughs> age but I think it's just like this kind of like yeah, my parents were watching, like, they used to watch a lot of, like, documentaries and stuff. So, um, yeah, I kind of remember just seeing, like, Jimi Hendrix playing and, like, just all these crazy sounds coming out of the guitar. And I was just like, I just want to be able to do that and express myself in that way. Um, but, yeah, I guess, like, my my dad was quite into, like, Human League and a lot of kind of, like, 80s bands and, like, uh, Japan. Um, and then my mum was kind of more into, like, a kind of dance and disco kind of cool. Yeah, sounds of sort of like Boney M and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, amazing. Quite, quite quite different, but... That's yeah. quite impressive. I was listening to Westlife when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You've got a nice education going straight away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from the Isle of Wight, so... Yeah. Uh, and was the music scene pumping in the Isle of Wight, like where I'm from? Or was it quite quiet? <laughs> it was, of- to be fair, it was quite sort of... It was very like singer songwritery. So it'd be like... Um, yeah, singer songwriters really. Um, you'd have the occasional metal band or oh, cool. like, indie rock band. Um, but it's funny, really, because as as I was leaving the Isle of Wight, like more and more, um, more and more bands were kind of like exploring hybrid setups um, and having like the kind of more like laptop on stage. Maybe they have a bit of like Ableton running or some like sample pads and things. And so I kind of felt like I was leaving at a time. I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm really in, I'm kind of into this. Yeah. But, <laughs> Yeah, I was also sort of drawn to London and um, kind of just the whole bigger picture kind of appealed to me. Um, so I kind of wanted to to do that and go to London. At what age did you decide, okay, I'm off <laughs> <laughs> um, to London? So I did um, like music college. There's a place oh, on the Isle of Wight. It's really funny because the Isle of Wight didn't have like loads of different things back then but it did have an amazing music college and it still does amazing. but I mean like it, it's just funny because it it was like okay like most people end up going to like um is it Bro- Brocklehurst Brocklehurst I don't know they go to like mainland colleges um to just basically have access to all the different courses but on the Isle of Wight I was able to go and study music full-time um at Platform One uh, so they do like a, they do kind of like GCSE level, A level uh, equivalents and they do a degree. And I think they now do a master's, oh, amazing. which is really cool. And it, to be honest, I learned so much 
um, when I was there because we would study sort of all sorts of like obviously we'd have like tuition on our instruments and then um, you'd have like music and society, music industry, uh, oral perception, things like that. So you'd be studying all sorts of aspects and, and studio and stuff like that. And it was it was amazing because also it was like free to go as well, um, which is great because I guess it meant that more people were able to access it um, than it being like an expensive paid thing, I guess, like uni. But um, to answer the question, I was probably like 18, I think. I'd like finished finished school, finished my um, A-level equivalents and then went to uni. It's great that they had so many different music avenues in that course. Like, I think a lot of us, when we were younger, it was kind of like classical music or no music in school, in like yeah, exactly. primary school and secondary school. So it's great that they had the different types as well, I think. Yeah. No, yeah people are interested in so many different routes. I think also one of the reasons why, like, I guess I did a bit of classical music and stuff. I did a bit of like, I did sort of like, what was it vocals, like grade eight and grade five of theory. Amazing. Stuff. Yeah, it, it was amazing, but it's also a really expensive thing to do. And also like if, I don't know, like because of like being dys- dyslexic and sort of neurodivergent, it, I actually found like so much anxiety and like the kind of reading the music Stress. kind of thing and following all these different things. And it was just quite stressful. But I think what I loved about um, kind of the more like music tech based things and production is it was always kind of like using your ears, always kind of like people in a B tech in music would be maybe like listening to a song and like like orally decoding what's going on and organizing the sounds in that way um which is an amazing skill to be able to do yeah um and not that people only do that in either or one or the other most commonly you see it happen and then with like a, a more classical setting people be like sight reading things straight off a sheet and not thinking about it and I think because of like accessibility as well just like being able to listen to something on youtube or on the radio and like sing it back you you know you can kind of just do that anywhere obviously you have to have the skills and the ability to do it but it's just something i think i really enjoyed in terms of like that kind of avenue of going down the kind of i guess like music production and kind of popular music areas like there's a lot of kind of just doing stuff by ear and you don't necessarily need to have to understand or read music or have all these other like kind of quite deep educational things and stuff I don't know I I completely agree with you it's kind of encourages creativity a bit more because you're not in this strict regime of having to like do what scales sight reading Uh, kind of I think production you're more encouraged to do your own thing and create which Definitely. is kind of a bit more freeing. When you first uh, moved to London, did you start working straight away or did you um, study in London as well? Yeah, so I, I went from um, Isle of Wight to... So from there, I went to Goldsmiths Uni. Oh, amazing. Um, I'd applied to a few different courses. Um, yeah, it's funny, really, because I'd applied to um, five different unis. I got offers from all of them, which was amazing. Oh, amazing. Well, especially as someone that, to be honest, like I didn't have much academic confidence. I I mean, I very much like I did really well in the kind of like drama, music areas and things like that. And I kind of like scraped by and like the mass English and sciences, to be honest. Yeah. So it was like when I got that kind of thing, I was like, wow, like actually maybe, maybe like maybe I can do academic things. And I had accepted and I was almost definitely going to go to Bath Spa Uni um, at the time. And then yeah I basically learned that the course the course would be like eight hours a day or something like that there'd be like loads of education and things like that going on um and that actually scared me off a lot I was like gosh like, that's going to be like a lot of information to try and process and also like I want to be able to like go into the things that I'm most interested in and kind of like just fixate on those um and then I kind of all of a sudden got this final offer through from Goldsmiths. And I was like, this has put such a spanner in the works. I remember we were like in the car on the Isle of Wight driving home. And I was like, oh dear, oh dear. Like my entire like next three year plan, plan changed. <laughs> and, I, and it was just like, oh God, like how am I going to, uh, I don't even know. So I ended up accepting the offer for Goldsmiths. I don't know if like people know the difference between there's like Bath Spa, which is like green fields like fresh air that kind of thing very serene and calming so my parents were like great like fantastic and then as soon as I was like goldsmiths they were like is that is is that it's very gray there it's yeah. very <laughs> gray and like loud and you know and I'm just in like, the middle yeah, of a city <laughs> that's the place I think I should go to <laughs> yeah. yeah 
So but you, you have yeah. to do the course that makes most sense for you, I suppose. Otherwise, well, it. and it was the kind of bigger, the bigger picture. I think the thing that excited me is the fact that there are going to be so many people obviously moving to London and there's going to be a lot of things to explore, not only with the course, but just like in my personal life or also going to like music things and industry people and like the, the main studios, things like that. It's like, it was still very much like a, you have to be in London kind of thing and, and you want to kind of meet as many people as you can. So I kind of, I just bit the bullet and, and went with that. So I ended up moving to uh, Goldsmiths, moving to Goldsmiths. I, I lit, my bedroom used to be opposite uh, New Cross Gate Station. So I, I kind of feel like I lived at Goldsmiths. On, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like right next door. But yeah. If you're, if you're going to go, you may as well be right in it. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, I felt like it. <laughs> well, and what kind of projects did they have you doing on the course or what was the kind of course content for anyone that would be interested in uh, yeah. doing something? So, I think something with Goldsmiths that was quite interesting is that a lot of people turn up as singer songwriters or they've dabbled in a bit of production. Um, you know, they're kind of maybe self-producing because I mean, everyone kind of hits that thing. I find um, like quite often where people, they have this like worry of, Oh, like if I don't write my own songs, if I have people help, like then I have to figure out royalties and I have to figure out all these different things. Or, you know, there's all these kind of little mini horror stories that you hear, or, like having management and all these things that when you're starting out, you sometimes end up, not really fully understanding what's happening people might be taking advantage of you so because you're young is that like people just see it as like you could be their kind of um project that they get to kind of shape because maybe their project didn't work or they lost the thing for it or loads of other reasons but yeah essentially there's all that kind of like naivety in a sense that when I look back I'm just like gosh like yeah it was a stressful time but um being on, on the course like I said you have like a lot of singer songwriters and producers um generally what happens is people come in and they're kind of playing the music that they've made obviously up until that point in their life and the course at goldsmiths like one of the first things that you do is or when i was there there was a course called um folk and urban music and it kind of really <laughs> it kind of pulls apart everything that that you've ever like done so i i kind of went in with quite like a yeah i guess like from the isle of Wight, it's quite folky uh singer songwriter acoustic guitar that kind of thing and um and they kind of like by by the end of the first year, I was like, I've not got any music again. I've, I've like don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's essentially, you go through all these different like courses, all these different things that kind of make you think about stuff and pull apart what you're doing, why you think you're doing it, you know, where it's coming from, um, and why it's you know like what what is it that makes you you, and stuff like that. And like in the second year, you end up like most people end up making something really like a, a kind of like. I don't know how to explain it. It just gets very like noisy and ambient and like people are really like pulling themselves apart over yeah. like what's their new sound, what, what are they doing? And by third year, you end up doing like a, a final performance of like where you're at. And um, usually it's they're pretty, pretty awesome performances, to be honest. Like that's, a, that's a, completely change. That's amazing though, because I think you learn the most through experimenting and like, yeah. Kind of listening to different kinds of music or trying different things and then you come around to whatever your style is so I think that's probably a sign it's a great course if people are doing that yeah I mean it's, it's, I mean that's definitely like from the kind of the songwriting like side of I think the thing with Goldsmiths is it's more like the social political awareness of what you're doing why you're doing it like who inspires you like what kind of artists what like I mean, you know, you might be looking into like musicologists or kind of like looking into like sonic arts or, you know, like there's so many aspects of the course that kind of make you go, wow, like this, this is amazing. Like you won't be taught how to write a song yeah, because there's, you can't really be taught that you need to essentially have something to say as an artist. And then like you need to go from there. You can't be kind of told what to say. Yeah. Um, which is why I guess it takes such a long time for, for people to kind of, figure that out and it's good with the course to kind of help you break it down and re reimagine kind of what you're doing um I feel like Goldsmiths basically gave, gave me like a lot of tools and it made me question a lot of things um as to why I'm doing them um and yeah if how and if I could do them differently and kind of reinvent the wheel <laughs> yeah that's amazing because I think most of us just go to uni and we're just focused on the technical aspects, like how to run Pro Tools. But that whole mm. why you're doing something is as important, if not more important than how you're doing it, I suppose. 
definitely well that's that's a really cool thing because like one of the things as well when when i was at goldsmiths like i'd never really heard of sonic art but i was always into like documenting and capturing things and so i used to yeah i have like all these like little like memos and things on my iphone and i think one cool thing with goldsmiths is because it wasn't always about making the best recording quality thing and submitting that to get a first it's what's your concept where did it come from and so a lot of my work kind of incorporated a lot of like found sounds and things like that that i'd recorded on my phone or cut up or um all sorts because it was more important the the concept of where it came from and that kind of forms the sound as well so like sometimes things were kind of like quite diy or low file or like kind of scrappy but then other times like you know you could also achieve you know, by going to the studio there, they also had a studio, which was another, the main reason I actually went there was because <laughs> of like a commercial level studio. And it's, it is like, it's like probably one of the best university studios I've ever seen. So, you know, you kind of have access to like dab- dabbling in the things that you want to explore, but also you have access to the equipment that you probably can't get at like some small studios even. Um, but yeah, I was just saying about the kind of um, found sound stuff yeah just kind of I guess that kind of came into my songwriting practice a lot um the kind of awareness yeah yeah I think it makes it more authentic if you have a concept rather than just being like I'm going to make the best track ever it's going to be the Mm. best produced track if you have a concept or an idea or a thought behind it I think it yeah it just makes it more believable like I I've like recently just done like a mix with someone that um yeah, he'd sent me the tracks and he'd recorded it over lockdown um, with a few friends. And one of the main, so the one track that runs throughout the whole Pro Tools session is just this like guitar loop that he'd recorded yeah. on his phone. Like, it, and it's just this like, it's even got a few like clicks and pops of where it started and stopped. And and it's just like that that has so much character. You know, it's that kind of thing. Like if we were to re-record it at Strong Room, like it, it wouldn't have like, the same vibe. It would sound lovely, but we'd be trying to create with like amazing gear. We'd be trying to recreate that sound, which I don't think you can't do because obviously you can do that. But it just made so much sense with his project. And like it also like the the attitude and the way that people want to do things. It's kind of like sometimes you have to follow that artist thing because it's like a unique thing to them. And it's like this, this, like this guy likes the documentation style of this. And therefore, if we overwrite it with like being in the studio, that's not where it came about. The rest of it, lots of little bits came from different areas as well. But yeah, I don't know. I just think it's acknowledging that side of things. And I guess I'm really fortunate that. I've started as a songwriter and I've ended up kind of in the kind of music production side of things. I kind of, I feel like, yeah, I'm very aware of those sorts of elements that are quite important to people in their kind of context. And the reason for why they make what they make is like a thing I always think about, I guess, when making decisions. No, that's a good, I think that's the most important thing to think about in, uh, in that kind of role is like what the artist wants to achieve, I suppose. Mm. But um, what I did want to ask, was it in Goldsmiths that you started uh, working with the Omni Collective? Uh, or yeah. that's reaching out? Yeah, well, what, what happened is, um, so Goldsmiths run a, um, like a, uh, what's it, um, student engineer program, basically. So when you're in your second year of uni, if you're really interested in studio stuff, you can Basically, the studio have this um, setup where they'll reach out to students that are already on the course, say in their second year, and there'll be like maybe 10, 10 students or something that are interested in recording opportunities. So what happens is whenever a student books, say, Studio One, what will happen is an email will be sent out to those 10 other students saying, oh, this student so-and-so has like requested a student engineer are you free on this day at this time to do this session and you do it for free but you're basically the studio is like giving you yeah, yeah giving you like jobs in the sense of like as a part of your course so it sounds really bad it's like they're giving you jobs but it's it's kind of like if you're wanting to get better and you've not really got any experience under your belt and you're at uni it's a really good time to be like I want to like try recording drums or try doing this or that. And that other student wouldn't be able to do it without your help anyway, even if it's just an extra pair of hands. So you both kind of fumble through the session um, and figure out what you're doing. That's incredible. Like I've never heard of a uni doing that before. Most of my friends who've studied music production, they leave and they're like, okay, so how do I get a job? So I think creating that network already while you're still studying is like amazing. 
Well, that's it. And then from from there, you can from there, they kind of do like a few maybe in like the following year. So your third year of uni, it's kind of like a you do it in your own time sort of thing. So outside of uni, it's like, you know, someone might book like the studio in the evening. So you kind of get involved and you can do that. But then there's sometimes like opportunities to assist um, engineers that are already working at the studio. Um, and then from there, what what can happen is there's a there's a, a professional practice scheme. Um, which you can apply to do. It's like a couple of years and it's um, it's difficult because it's kind of your, so you're sometimes you're assisting sessions, sometimes you're in the office kind of like doing bookings and things like that. So it's one of those classic jobs in music where you're kind of doing a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it, it was definitely one of those that it allowed me to have access to like booking, for example, having like studio bookings on a weekend. So when I wasn't working in the week, I could like, this was like a paid job after uni. Um, so basically I'd had like a year out in industry and then I had applied for this job. Um, but yeah, so basically, yeah, you can apply to do either the live sound one or the studio one. And from there you basically have like so many hours a week and you'll come in and you'll be doing like, I guess like helping a lot of the students with their bookings. So sometimes you'll get like a master student or, an undergrad be like, I want to do this drum recording, that drum recording. And you're basically working on that session and there might be a student engineer there. So you're overall kind of seeing over that if you see, so you're kind of responsible for that situation. But yeah, it's, it's cool. Cause it, it does again, open your eyes to like loads of different situations. Um, and is, yeah. that, is that how you started building up your network as a freelance, like engineer and mix engineer? Was it through those sessions you kind of started to get your own paid work and you kind of went from there or do you remember your first like gig as a professional engineer mix engineer yeah so it, it's interesting really because uh so at goldsmiths when, when i was actually studying at goldsmiths i was the like i was doing like live sound for the students union so i've very much started as like i came to the uni like as a singer songwriter and then kind of got into more like production stuff. And then I'd already had like a bit of a background in sound engineering from when I was back on Isle of Wight. Cause I used to end up doing my own sound sometimes for gigs. Cause it was so bad. So I ended up yeah, that's amazing. So, yeah, Get out I, of my way. I'll do it myself. <laughs> yeah, I, did. It was, I mean, yeah, I was, I was really lucky. Like um, from like doing gigs and stuff, like me and my dad went half on a, like a little PA system. So I just basically had a PA system when I was like 16. That's incredible. And I could do sound for myself and sound for other people. Yeah. So you're saying about what was the kind of first first engineering job and I think it was difficult to put my finger on it because essentially like from the minute I got to Goldsmiths I'd like bought like a little mic and I was already like recording people out of my room until I kind of gained access to the recording studio which you had to kind of show a certain sort of level of like do you understand how this plugs in and that does that and you kind of have to like basically book in an induction and it takes like a few weeks to get doing that so from the get-go I was like I'm just gonna like start recording stuff in my bedroom and I was working with mates already on my course I've met in like freshers week um so just kind of like straight into it and then that's when I was saying I also then got the students union job um and I did that for like a couple years um and then I was like doing the student engineering and then after that I had like a year out in I say year out I'd finished my degree um and was working freelance doing like some kind of like I don't know what you call them. They're just kind of like, like random jobs in terms of like, I might've been like doing, so I worked in like a cheese and champagne place in Greenwich. Amazing. Yeah. It was like <laughs> a month and a half. And then like another place that was like a month and a half. I just had all these like random jobs that kind of, I tried to keep doing music jobs and just slotting in these other jobs around it. But then after that kind of year, I then applied for the job at Goldsmiths because it was like a stable kind of, this is how many hours a week you're doing. This is what you're going to learn in the week. You essentially help uh, master students and students. You run workshops, um, which is where Omni kind of like Omni had already started up before I got the job there. Um, and that was uh, with Fran, Francine and, um, and Joy, who I was working with. So they both work on the Omni collective. And I was just kind of like occasionally there, sometimes popped in and like helped out with a workshop. Um, but yeah, from from there, it was kind of just, yeah, it was all sorts of jobs. And then on the weekends, um, we could book. So one of the perks of the job is that on the weekend, you can book um, studio time, um, bring people in, do sessions. And that, that's when I did start bringing in 
I guess it was mates. Like I was just going to a lot of gigs at the time and just always like, if you want to come to the studio, we can, you know, we can record this, we've got a great space. And I had the ability to be like, I can make bookings at this studio and get like a good price so that I could start building up with people. A network. So, yeah, exactly. It wasn't like going in being like, so I can record you for 500 pounds. Yeah. yeah <laughs> kind of like, you know, you could do it much cheaper and kind of like a downtime rate. And, and that was, that was like a massive help in being able to like, get people in a studio, get learning, get doing stuff. But um, yeah, from there, it just kind of went into, I guess, like industry, like industry stuff. I'd already made a few connections in that year after I graduated. So it was more like the studio job at Goldsmiths was just kind of like a, it's like an ongoing kind of building on stuff, having a space to record that I knew. Um, but yeah, in, in that time I'd met um, Charlie, Deacon Davies. So that's when we started, like, we, we just kept bumping into each other at different events. And then over time, we've just kind of like, yeah, we've just essentially like started coming up with our own sort of collectives and having other people involved as well. So there's like four of us involved in this new collective that we're setting up. And yeah, it's just kind of, kind of like snowball effects from there, really. Uh, yeah. And could you tell us a bit about the Trans Creative Collective and like what your goals and your aims are? Sure. So yeah, exactly. It's um, it's basically there's myself, Charlie Deacon Davies, Jesse Fay, and uh, Nelly uh, Rodriguez, and basically we're yeah we we all kind of came up with this idea of um setting up a a space that's kind of founded by sort of trans identifying people because I guess there's a lot of um there's a lot of platforms that we'd sort of noticed like basically about five years ago um when me and charlie met we were at different events like bbc events or kind of just like more like low-key events and we were like this is amazing that there's like there's this platform for women to get opportunities and do things and then over time people started to kind of like be more aware of like non-binary as a thing and stuff like that but we wanted to like i don't know we just kind of felt sometimes like being in those spaces it was quite like it can be quite for me it was quite like dysphoria inducing um because ultimately I would have wanted to have like more spaces that might have like more trans masculine people or just trans people or yeah. people that I could look up to and be like he's doing it or like they're doing it or you know what I mean it was just kind of wasn't really there so I guess it's that kind of thing we realized over time that it would probably be us that need to do something because we couldn't find like anything that was doing these kinds of things yeah um but yeah, so I guess we kind of very recently, uh, it was like Trans Day of Visibility in March. And we had this idea that we'd basically uh, create like a mini documentary, just kind of like celebrating and showing like a fully sort of trans identifying like cross intersectionalities kind of, like it, it was all very organic the way that everyone sort of came together and we're all mates. And um, yeah, we just had this idea and we spoke to Abbey Road about it and ended up, like doing a recording session in studio three and making a documentary talking about like trans things but also studio stuff and yeah just kind of went from there and then we were like well maybe we should do like maybe we should do something again maybe we should like make a thing with this and you know people seem to really take to it and we've like yeah I don't know we just kind of thought it was a I really wanted to yeah. ask you about the documentary because I watched it recently and it's amazing but you planned the whole thing in a week and a half right yeah, I mean, to be fair, I'll put that down to Charlie's like oh, okay. ADHD brain. <laughs> like they, they, they did literally were just like, so we're going to do all these different things. And I was just there like, okay, cool. Like, okay, <laughs> okay. But yeah, in about a week and a half, two weeks, we'd managed to sort of put a call out for an artist, pull together our team of like engineers, producers, um, artists, like camera crew, everyone we managed to like pull everyone together um come up with this idea be like planning stuff and yeah we got like a we got featured in uh, gay times and we were obviously like yeah made this crazy mini documentary which has been put out on abbey roads socials and it, yeah it's it was pretty pretty crazy to be honest i don't think i'd ever been a part of something that happened so quickly yeah um it, I think yeah, that's yeah. Prob probably good in a way you don't have time to overthink anything like you, I heard yeah. you mention in the doc, doc that it felt really like kind of organic and natural and probably having to do mm. it in that short a time 
probably it kind of helped that in a way because you don't have time to kind of like overanalyze every it's aspect just do 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 isn't it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah just get point, on with it like we need to do this oh what about this idea not this time <laughs> like yeah. you just have to have to and go for it but did yeah. you come out with a finished uh mastered track from that uh is that available online or anything um, or um is it- I think so. I'm not sure with the ins and outs as to oh, like no if we can dis- I don't know how it's how it is. Oh, um, I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was yeah, we we did like an entire day and we've tracked loads of vocals and had loads of backing vocals and things like that. We it, we were kind of mainly focusing on like um I guess like lead vocal and production and stuff like that. Because obviously like having a day in the studio, if we'd gotten a whole band in, it would have been absolutely crazy. Yeah. But um yeah, no, it's, it, the documentary is actually available on um, Abbey Road's socials. I should probably send a link to that. But. Yes, we're going to send out an email after this session with a few links because you've also given us a link for to people to sign up for more information about the Trans Creative Collective. So I yeah. think the guys are sending out the link to that. And we're also going to send out a follow up email with some more uh, links of stuff you've mentioned today. Nice. Uh, so don't worry about that. Uh, have the Trans Creative Collective got any plans for 2022 yet, or is it kind of COVID dependent so far? <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing. We've been scheming. We've got plans. <laughs> um, so we've, we've been speaking with um, a studio uh, called 1087 um, up in Tottenham, Tottenham Hill, roughly. There, there it is. North, very north of where I am. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've been... Um, sort of coming up with some ideas we're going to have some workshops and socials um I think we've got sort of like three events that we've been sort of planning and sort of just like hashing out ideas for um I guess like with those events what we're trying to do is obviously bring together we want to create like a safe space um for people that are not only in music but it's it's like a multidisciplinary like it's a across the kind of board of um creative so w- what we found when we did the abbey road thing when we were doing a call out for people um to be the artist um we basically had a lot of people that were like oh, i'm an artist i do this or i, I do um, drag or i'm a photographer or you know like all sorts of people that do loads of different things so it's we not just music be, well exactly we, we wanted to create like a space where people that you know people can try out maybe it'd be like they want to try out new pronouns or things like that like a social but it'd be a safe space but also an opportunity to meet other like-minded people um yeah so it's just kind of like this real kind of like mashup of create creatives and sort of queer people and allies you know so it's just yeah. building up that network and then yeah, it'll kind of go from there it's something essentially it's something that i think that quite early on when i moved to london i just felt like i didn't have like access to I didn't really find that community and not that it wasn't out there but I just remember attending a lot of like at the time I was attending a lot of like women's events um because I was like non-binary for like five years and I just never felt like represented I never felt like seen or heard I never I I just went so quiet in those spaces and I, I just got to a point where I felt so dysphoric seeing like loads of women in the space and being like I just I really don't connect to this yeah I stopped going and that's when with this it's like how can we make a space that feels you know safe and you know for people that are neurodivergent as well like we want our events to have like a crash zone where it's like okay you can like have 10 minutes out in that zone like and you know things to be not so that it's all in one room and it's all going on it's kind of split up so we're going to have like audio stuff maybe in one room and and like visual things in another room so it's kind of I don't know it's just trying to make make a space and take up a bit of space that kind of hasn't been taken up or led by people of like the first-hand experience I guess yeah no but it, it makes sense because even moving to a new city is lonely enough like <laughs> yeah like do you know what I mean it's yeah. kind of I think what you're doing is incredible of just giving people a space to even connect with each other um Definitely. and like to share information and help each other out I think it's just it's amazing um, and the other group, you're on the board of directors for engineering equality um, in Brighton. Could you tell us a little bit about what they do and uh, what kind of stuff they get involved in? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the engineering equality came about. So basically, there's a studio in Brighton called Small Pond, um, and 
so uh, so basically Omni have connections with Small Pond and they were getting funding for this thing that they'd come up with. They're like, okay, cool, we're doing this like um we're going to be basically having um free uh, like audio production mixing workshops wow. um, for women and trans identifying people and non-binary people and that's when um, my friend joy reached out to me and was just like do you want to be a part of this thing that we're doing and i was like well, obviously like this is amazing this is really cool like we're still in a lockdown like, this is like january like january gone and it was just one of those where it's just kind of like January was such, I don't know about everyone else, but it was just so bleak. Yeah. <laughs> it was so bleak because it was like, we all knew that things were going to be like in lockdown until like April or something. Like For we were the next still like 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah well, exactly. It's just, it felt like it, but we were still under this illusion of like, cool, we know that things aren't going to be, you know, changing for the foreseeable so kind of having that like six week period of like, I had 10 people that I was mentoring. Um, and they're all, it's amazing, like, seeing where people were at and where they are now and, like, the songs that they've mixed and produced or the panels that they're now on and, and doing talk, talks for. And, you know, it's really, it's wicked to think that, like, I was able to, like, help people navigate those spaces. Um, yeah, I, I think it's pretty, pretty awesome. But, yeah, the, the idea is that it was a free workshop delivered by, um, so, yeah, it was at the time Small Pond and Omni that were delivering a free course for people of those identities. Um, it's kind and of it really, it's, it's so simple, but it was amazing. I was wanted to ask you about the mentoring thing. Is that something people can reach out online if they were interested in getting mentoring? Um, is that something they could kind of like look up with the engineering equality online um, and kind of get involved that way? Or how does the whole mentoring process work? How does someone find a mentor essentially? Sure. So yeah. I can, in the document that um, I'm putting together, uh, like different resources, I'll put a link into um, the engineering equality uh, website. But yeah, it's, it's still very early days. I literally don't actually know when the next when the next round is. I just know that I oh, no worries. I'd imagine it's going to be a similar time to um, to what, you know, sort of like last year, may, maybe early next year. Um, but there really there's no dates that I've got just yet. Um, but I do know that it will be again, like it should be free and it should be kind of like similar to the last event, but bigger and better. And hopefully we'll find more funding to do more things. Um, I really can't say too much. But no, fair, completely fair. Definitely. I'll put the website or, or there's whatever details I've got for it. Um, it's funny because both these collectives, both these things are at such early stages, but it's so exciting because I just know that from the responses that we've had from the first like documentary Abbey Road and then the first round of the the mentoring with with engineering quality like it's just it was just taken so well I think we had like 80 80 to 100 applicants for for the small pond one like that that's just so many people insane and it just shows you the need for it like it's like, crazy. It's more yeah. people than than I had on my course at uni. Like, I think I had like fifty <laughs> yeah. people in my class. Same. At uni. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? It's like, terrible. Yeah, it, yeah. It's free as well, and it's it's fantastic because I don't know. I just think it's a it's a great way of learning because I don't think it's difficult with unis and and stuff like that. It's not so you know you learn certain things from uni and you can learn certain things from being out on a job and or in with a mentor. Like you, you're going to get different kinds of life experiences. Yeah. Um which which are helpful in different ways i guess yeah but, yeah well not to toot your horn too much but you do you do give a lot back in terms of you try and get involved in as many things do you find that helps you has that helped you on your own kind of like with your own experience or what was your reasoning for getting involved with so many of these things yeah no i mean exactly i i, I kind of feel like i I can't you kind of get to a point where you're like I feel like I want to give back to like a place like for, you want to give something back to someone that you've taken so much from and I feel like just kind of yeah like it, it's quite inspiring like giving back into um in, into yeah with with music it's just kind of I kind of feel it with like you know engineering or mixing it's like I'm not necessarily I'm not going to be the artist for it but I'm I'm giving something some love. I'm giving it that kind of like detail and attention that it wants and to make something, you know, better or, or to collaborate and make something bigger than it would have been before. And that's the same in like a social setting of like kind of my own personal kind of experience of being trans. It's like, I, I wanted to, 
I kind of came to London with this idea. I was like, I'm going to like meet loads of people. I'm going to be able to like, explore things. I'm going to have my own space and, you know, I won't have to have all the kind of like triggers or things from, from back home, just the way that school was and stuff like that. And, and just growing up to that point can be quite difficult. So I guess it was trying to create a space that I'd taken so much, like it, I was so inspired by the women's events and things I'd been to, but because of my own identity and experience, I was like, this should be making me feel great. Yeah. It made me feel great. It makes me feel worse, but it is, I can see why it's so great for the people that are really enjoying this. Yeah. How, how can, where I is our really, Yeah, exactly. And through like creating these different spaces or being a part of like being the mentor that I didn't feel I ever was able to access, like, or see on panels doing talks, like seeing someone that is doing that and being like, cool. Like they're, they're like trans, they're, they're out about it. They're open about it. They're, you know, they're kind of doing their own thing. It's kind of reassuring to just see that existence. Cause they're just, it, I honestly can't tell you like who I would look up to in terms of like all round person. I don't have like someone that I'm like, oh, this trans guy so-and-so is like amazing. Or, you know, I don't have that. And I guess it's trying to, see Green. what I don't know it, it, without it sounding weird like trying to fulfill that role or, or be it maybe you know or like, yeah even <laughs> help, if you even help one, one person <laughs> I think we'll like yeah. but I was going to ask you as well obviously we have a crazy far way to go but since you moved to London have you seen any positive in changes in terms of the music industry or do you think we're still at a, a standpoint at a standstill no I mean I think I think it I think nothing really ever stays completely still like things are always ever changing. And I think that um, even in the time that I've been in the industry, it's things like when I was working at Goldsmiths, um, it was cool because um, Joy, I I speak about Joy so much. Um, (laughs) Joy's a great, like Joy's an amazing engineer, a mixed engineer as well. Um, Yeah. They they work with Omni, so you can probably find them on Omni um, Mm -hmm. if you go to their website, but yeah. So, Joy was like speaking to me one day at Goldsmiths and we we're talking about pronouns and things that would make like me more comfortable at the studio. First thing, it was really nice having someone that wasn't trans coming up to me and being like, how can we make things less stressful for you? And I was like, wow, like you've, con- you've considered the fact that I'm stressed when I'm getting misgendered, which makes a lot of sense. So we kind of had this, um, yeah, we had this chat and Joy came up with this idea of like, on all email sign-offs at the studio, we'd have our name and our pronouns, whether or not you're cisgender, which is someone who is um, born, say, born and assigned male at birth and lives as male, for example. Um, So yeah, basically cis people or trans people, everyone would kind of sign off their email with like their preferred name and pronouns. And that was a great act because it just essentially meant that we were normalizing you know, normalizing yeah. the thing that we're all putting our pronouns. And for the average, like maybe the average kind of older person, they might kind of be like, what, what is this and stuff? But it's kind of like, I guess sometimes you have to implement these ideas for people to go, actually, this makes a lot of sense. Or like, yeah. I never thought about this before. So it is kind of sometimes trying to take that step and, and implement it. But yeah, I do feel lucky in that the studios I've worked in, it's it's not always me having to push for things, which is great because sometimes when you're going through something, it's really hard to also be proactive on it because sometimes you need a bit of distance from it in order to yeah. process and, and be around it. So I've always had like similar experiences like here where like a few months back I was like misgendered and um, my friend kind of like stepped in at the time and was just like, oh like Max is a guy <laughs> like, you know yeah. and this kind of awkward conversation where it's just kind of like and like vacant like had gone when it happened and then like came back it was just so triggering and I didn't realize it would be so triggering because I didn't I wasn't ready for it essentially yeah but I think that's the thing is that having a supportive um kind of workforce around you and people that are for you as well it's it's, it's amazing like that is like one thing I would say is like if if you do know someone that is trans or non-binary of any sort of in any way like just asking them like what would make their life a bit easier like what what might help them in 
in stuff I don't know like some people don't want to discuss it but you yeah you said this thing yesterday that really stuck with me you were like people are afraid of making mistakes so they just avoid avoid the topic altogether but I think at this stage we all need to suck it up and like just (laughs) like kind of getting get engaged and get educated like that was something that was in my head for like hours after you said it because people like are some people are not malicious they're just afraid and it's kind of like you need to get, get yourself informed and at least try (laughs) <laughs> I'm exactly. yeah. it's, it's better to like so this is I mean yeah this is a record really important one because I get it a lot with like family and stuff like that where you kind of you saying to someone like someone might be like worried that sometimes what happens is someone will be going maybe like a cisgender person might be saying oh what you don't understand is that um you know like it takes time to understand you've changed your name or your pronouns or something like that and it's like the thing is, we're not all that different. We're quite similar. And the reality is you're telling a person who's of trans identity who probably has like a few other trans friends. So they've probably like got five times the amount of people yeah. that they're having to learn new names and pronouns for that they're still making loads of mistakes like within the community and with, you know, and, and ex- just in life, like people do that. People make mistakes all the time. It's where it's coming from is what, what I always sort of try to remind people is if you're not doing it maliciously, which you're probably not, then people will forgive, like people will understand and they'll appreciate that you're trying. I yeah. think that's the best thing though, is just always ask and always try. If you don't know someone's pronouns or you don't know, you know, if there is a preferred name, um, you know, that they would like to use, always ask. Because, you know, that gives someone the opportunity to say something that they probably don't have the confidence to just outright say, oh, I'm changing my name or I don't like that pronoun. Like sometimes if you kind of bring it up as a topic, it's it, it's, it's, amazing. it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. what people say when they're given a, a platform to speak. Yeah. You know? I, and it, I think the whole strong room, everyone email kind of thing is a very simple and easy way to try and eliminate some of that kind of like having to, you don't want to have to speak up for yourself all the time. Okay. Well, anyway, I think I've been ranting on for too long. We had a couple of uh, amazing questions come in from social media and stuff. So I just wanted, we had one come in for any advice for someone who is looking to find work in a studio like strong room, how to stand out. Yeah. I mean, I guess so. The, the way I actually got working at Strongroom was because of another studio. And that's the kind of knock on effect of, yeah, but how did you get into that studio? Um, obviously I can only speak from my own experience in that. Um, I essentially just wanted to get off the Isle of Wight and be in London. Cause that's where I was like, I'm going to try and make things happen there. But so for me, it's like, I was obviously at uni and then from, from uni, I took as many different like, opportunities within the uni that they had so that was like the live sound thing it's a studio thing so at this point I was working at Goldsmiths at the studio um as like a I guess as as like a mem yeah as like an engineer there and um basically on the weekends I was booking out studio time and taking in bands that I'd gone to gigs and I'd watched them play and I was like oh you know I've got access to studio like we can record there and do these things um, so I was posting quite a lot on Instagram and basically the studio manager, um, or studio manager at the time, also the technical manager. Um, but yeah, so Jake who works at strong room was like commenting on, on things just being like, Oh, this is amazing. Like, you know, this is really cool. Like, or like commenting, like really nerdy stuff basically. And so it got to a point where I actually just privately messaged him on Instagram and I was like, by the way, and I was like, he, I, there was like a jokey thing of like, I knew that. I was about to do the thing that everyone does where it's like, if there's ever a chance or, you know, a thing like that. So it's kind of like, he'd seen me like doing lots of things. And then he was like, Oh, I was actually going to ask you to come in and like do some stuff or whatever. So, you know, basically it's just like the, I think when it always kind of like listening out and like, if, if someone's kind of like, Oh, you should come and hang out. We've got a Christmas party or I know it's a bit difficult with COVID, but often if there's like social events, or someone's like, oh, you should come down and do this. Or, oh, we're going to be at that thing next week. Try and go to those things. Try and be at those events. Because it's not just standing out in the studio. Like, I, I post pictures of stuff, not because I was looking to get a job at another studio. I was doing it to, like, hopefully get, you know, other people to, like, message me and be like, yeah, let's do stuff. But, yeah, I guess it kind of, because I was posting consistently on social media, I guess it meant that other studios saw what I was doing because I was also tagging that studio. But I think that, 
for getting jobs and things like that, the best thing you could do, if if you've got a mate or a friend of a friend that's like building a studio or has like a kind of production space, that's one of the best bets is like going going in and around there and like going to loads of gigs essentially, just even open mics. Like I've, I've honestly, like when I first came to London, I'd like go to, I'd speak to someone on the street and be like, I really like what you're doing. Do you want to like do some vocal recording in this studio? <laughs> I was and just going to say, it's, it sounds like you don't sleep. So you just work all day yeah. and then go to gigs at night. <laughs> I'm not very good at sleep, but I'm trying to. I don't I don't caffeinate anymore. No. Oh, wow. I, I can't give up coffee. I wish I could. <laughs> yeah. right, we have oh, another question okay. from uh, Kursat. I hope I'm saying your name right. Sorry if I'm not. Um, so I'm not sure if you've worked at all with Dolby Atmos Music or Spatial Audio, but he said people's music listening habits have changed a lot and almost everyone is listening to music with headphones and mobile phones in this context what do you think about Dolby Atmos and spatial audio have you listened to much have you dabbled um so I actually haven't done much with Dolby Atmos I mean I guess like I think my parents tv has it I think it's quite <laughs> yeah. interesting um I don't have any like strong opinions on it I think it's I think it's pretty cool um yeah I've not because I, I guess it's more of like a <laughs> I have this like re- regular anxiety of one day, like, we won't just be mixing, like, stereo. Like, people will constantly yeah. want, like, <laughs> surround sound mixes. <laughs> yeah. But I I, def- I mean, they're pretty cool. Like, I feel like it's from, like, a career pathway, like, mixing point. It's like, I'm just, like, trying to focus on on Fair. normal stereo stuff. But, like, yeah. but um, I think, yeah, the spatial audio is quite interesting. I've actually got a pair of AirPods um, and it's weird it'd be like listening to an audiobook and you turn your head and it, yeah. it moves with you and you're just there like it's quite disorientating when you're not used to it the first time like it's just kind of a bit like you got to get your bearings it's unusual but I think I do think it's a pretty exciting way and I think it's gonna I mean like I'm pretty sure it's gonna massively take off um I, yeah I don't know I'm a bit scared of it in terms of my like professional practice at the minute yeah. but I enjoyed it I I think it's I think it's cool I'm not yeah, I don't know where I'm at with it, to be honest. No, fair. And um, we have like two more and then I promise I'll let you go. Sorry. Um, we're nearly at the hour. Uh, so in the next five years or so, have you anything career wise or collective wise you'd like to achieve? Is there anything particular or you just want to keep? Or, sorry, that's such a broad question. There's so know. many things. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I, I'm sort of seeing. Um, I'm kind of. So I'm seeing the the transcreative collective taking off. I'm seeing like us having mentoring. I'm seeing maybe uh, we're thinking of doing some kind of like um, sort of trans consultancy stuff. Um, there's going to hopefully be like a lot more mixing. I'm hoping to work with a lot more. Like there's so many people that have that I've kind of been in contact with who are trans identifying and want to do like a lot more like mixing production work with me. So I'm hoping to get more involved in sort of co-producing, mixing and engineering um, within the community as well. Like that's something that I think is quite exciting for me and that this, the Trans Creative Collective is something that we can kind of lift up those voices and, and kind of put people on that platform for. But um, then I guess, I, I mean, like I'm just kind of at the minute, I'm like preparing for um, I'm preparing for my top surgery, which I'm hoping to have in like maybe like May ish next year. So I'm kind of in that mindset thing where I'm like yeah, trying yeah. to save, trying to be going to the gym, trying to be looking after like mental health, physical health, all of that. So it's not it's not just like career as well. It's all those things and trying to prepare for the for the moments where I might be out of action and yeah. accepting and understanding that. Um, so what, yeah. did, what would the recovery time be for like something like that it's like from start to finish it's probably like I've seen people say about like 12 to 14 weeks yeah so you really need but to mentally prepare that's the thing it's yeah. like you can do some things like that you know I might still be able to do some like mixing or I might be able to do like I don't know I just won't be able to like lift massively heavy things basically but it's all these different things um I was speaking to Olga Fitzroy the other day about like how how I was kind of feeling about that on like the kind of mental health side of things and and she was mentioning about like with like pregnancy leave and things like that and I was like this is such a good point like it's so good to talk about these things because there are so many different reasons why people might have to dip in and out of stuff whilst they're trying to build their career um and that's a scary thing in the music industry you feel like you need to be going 90 like 
100 like, yeah, 24 like, hours a day like yeah so I think it's just that kind of trying to have that balance as well in amongst the chaos of like the music industry it's I think something I've been working on quite a lot is trying to see the industry like seeing it as like there's this thing that I'm involved in sometimes I'm in it sometimes I'm like it exists here but there's other aspects of my life that I have to check in with in order to make myself even better for that and to make myself you know even better for this I need to give time so it's kind of trying to as you get older kind of seeing these balance different, different things yeah and trying to get a balance you know it's very difficult it's hard yeah <laughs> but yeah for, to be honest it's seeing the collectives take off um yeah kind of just op- ideally I just I just really want people to be able to access vocational things for free yeah. and like, I think that's what these collectives kind of bring is a safe space hopefully um for people that are allies or people of experience can be a part of and yeah and for things to just be kind of less like elitist in the sense of you know if you can't afford to move it to London and you can't go to a London uni you can't do things like you can't do the things like there's people back home that are you know like they weren't able to come to London and do uni I was able to do that yeah and it's like you know, that's meant I've made all these connections and I'm doing this talk now and there's other things and it's like there's some people that haven't been able to do that for various reasons and then there's like a whole hierarchy of different like kind of weird capitalist reasons why things happen and don't and it's just I yeah it sucks because you 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 can't you lose talent you essentially lose yeah. talent um and but I it's just like where your pockets, you know, where, where you're from and what what your background is determines whether you get opportunities or access to these Absolutely. things, which is yeah, mind boggling. I, I just feel so lucky as well for like what what I have been able to have and do. Um, even though some aspects of my life haven't been particularly straightforward, I feel extremely lucky in terms of being able to get to where I've gotten to now. And I do think that it would be amazing to to be able to create those opportunities for other people that maybe don't have that and kind of just like pull people in and be like look here's all the information here's all the stuff like what do you need you know um and being able to try and help kind of link people up that's something I think I'm I've always kind of been quite passionate about is linking people up um but yeah Uh, to be honest I think what you're doing is really really inspiring on a whole and uh, I, I feel like I could talk to you all day um, yeah. but I should probably let you get back to your session that you're working on but I just want to say a massive thank you for uh, coming to talk to us today and giving us your time and uh, just again a quick note that we will be sending out an email with some of the links to some of the stuff Max has discussed today for anyone who wants to check out or get some more information but yeah thanks again Max and thanks everyone for joining today Amazing. Thanks again, everyone, for having me on board. This, yeah, it's been amazing to chat with you. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>